And now it's time for Money Talks, my daily interview series. Joining me today, another fabulous British entrepreneur, business leader and philanthropist, that's Dominic McVeigh. Now, when the majority of us were coming to grips with hitting puberty, Dominic was starting his own business. At the age of 13, he began importing micro scooters from the United States, selling several million of them from his bedroom and helping to spark the micro scooter craze, which 20 years later continues to this day. By the grand old age of 15... Dominic was Britain's youngest self-made millionaire and three years later, the Queen appointed him pioneer for Britain in entrepreneurialism. This is someone who's achieved more in his teens than most of us do in a lifetime. So let's meet the man himself, Dominic McVeigh. No longer in your teens, Dominic, but still doing business, deeply involved in philanthropy. Welcome to Money Talks. It's great to have you with us. So the micro scooter craze. Every time I go outside my back garden, there's like micro scooters everywhere because my son's had about four or five of them. So, I mean, what possessed you? You were 13 years old. Why weren't you out climbing trees and playing football? Well, maybe you were as well. Well, no, I certainly was falling out of trees and kicking balls around. But <laughs> I, was, uh, I was also very fortunate where, through my dad's work, he travelled a lot and I saw a lot of the world. Not because we had money, he used to get free tickets. And that inspired me to to see so much more and head into places like Japan, New York, Australia at a very young age. And he worked up at the Barbican Centre near Liverpool Street in central London. And just seeing, you know, people with suitcases and briefcases and computers, that got me really thinking all the time. You're a curious kid. Very, very curious kid. And um, my grandmother passed away and she left me some money and I bought a computer. And I got online, and I think it was called CompuServe back then. Yeah. And it was so a, was this early, mid-90s? I'm doing yeah, m- mid-90s, yeah. I'd say. And I was, there was not much to see, but I found this business card in the Financial Times once, and it said, Charles Schwab Europe Trading. And I thought, oh, this is a sign. So I tried to sign up to this trading website and buying some stocks and shares, and it didn't really go to plan. So I needed a Visa card, and I thought I'd get a credit card didn't really go to plan, but I found this company in America called Visa, spelt differently, and had these fold-up motorised microscooters. And from there, I said, I called him up, I said, I love your product, can I have one? And he said, no, but uh, you can buy one. I said, well, I can't afford to buy one. So I explained to him that I've got some good contacts in London. I didn't have contacts. Um, <laughs> and that if he sent me one for free, I'm sure I could sell some for him. And he said, I'll tell you what, if you can sell five, I'll give you one for free. Not bad. And he was, I think, humouring me, but also not realising I was only 13 at the time. And <laughs> this guy was in America. Anyway, I managed to sell five of uh, these uh, scooters. Uh, I mean, but this is the mid-90s, right? It's not like you can talk to him on WhatsApp. It's costing you £3 a minute on your mum and dad's phone, for instance, well, I, right? I, I had a workaround on that. <laughs> when my dad was at work, I used to pick up the phones and start calling America and, <laughs> places um, so you know there was, you always had to find a way to get through the battle so to speak and I was convinced I like these scooters I'm sure other people will and it was as simple as that to start with so you started selling these scooters and it and it took off yeah I mean did you tell your parents did you tell your friends at school um, it all came out when I think Channel 4 News turned up at the school gates <laughs> Um, a, a researcher... Could have been me, I worked for them back then. A, a, re- a researcher had discovered that there's this kid in Leytonstone in East London selling scooters all around the world. And it was, you know, I think it was a shock to a lot of people, but at the same time, I was locked in my bedroom. My mum probably thought I was playing computer games or who knows what. But I was there sending emails, calling up retailers all over the world. And it was just me. So they'd say, well, can we talk to someone in your finance department? And I'd say, yeah, I'll put Dave on the phone, name of my cat. <laughs> put a deeper voice on. And I'd say, uh, yeah, finance here. And I, I had 12 <laughs> or 15 different email addresses going. And it looked like a big multinational. It was, it was you know. Well, what kind of a kid were you at school? Were you, you're obviously a really precocious person, <laughs> confident person and canny person. Did you respond to regular teaching at school? Did you do well in your GCSEs? I think. Did you do A levels? Did you go to university? No. So I 
the school actually asked me to leave when I was about 15, just before the exams. Uh, and my mum went bonkers and went up to school and said... Did you not do your homework or something? Why did they want you to leave? I, I think I had the highest absentee r- right. level going. Because you were at home running this business. Well, I was at home. Oh, what I used to do, I used to go up to, like, Covent Garden and stand outside the train station giving out flyers <laughs> with the scooters. I mean, it was really old-school uh, sales tactics. I used to go to Liverpool Street Station... I found out that you used to have to pay and I'd get chased by the security guards. But you would meet people, you'd engage, you'd sell products. So I used to... Sorry, Mr Russell, I did bunk off school to go and sell scooters. I didn't have a doctor's appointment. Yeah, so there's a lot of that going on. So the school found me a real challenge. And, you know, I was constantly on lunch breaks on the the pay phones at the school, trying to call people up, what's happening, trying to sell products. Now, for people who don't know, Leytonstone's... You know, the East End of London, it's produced some incredible people over the years. You've got the E17 guys. You've also got people like Alfred Hitchcock came from Leytonstone, as as you well know, as I know people... I I, I used to live not far up the road from you. Um, What is it about these areas that produces people like you, sassy, streetwise entrepreneurs who go on to do incredible things from relative poverty? I'm guessing you weren't from a wealthy background... You know, Leytonstone in the mid '90s was not a particularly flash part of London, right? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. If, if I told even up until early 2000s, when I told people I was from Leytonstone, they'd walk away. That's right. Um, you know what I think it is? I think it's on the Leytonstone is on the cusp of a very green part of London. That's right. The, the Lee Valley and the Lee all Valley, of that. Epping Forest, where there's a lot of money, and it's also only 12 minutes from the city on the Central Line. I'm not here to promote Leighton Stone. I don't own any property there. But the, I think growing up there, you see a lot of wealth around you. Yeah, yeah. And because of that, um, it's, it, it inspires you to, to want those opportunities too. And I think because, of, fortunately, my father was able to travel, um, I was able to see so much opportunity. And I wanted to be part of that. I knew that there was better quality of life to be had. My my mum had cancer when I was growing up and a lot of pollution in the area. The hospitals weren't great. Yeah, you know, it's a busy I was, area. I was very driven to try and provide a better life as a, as a young man, as a, not as a teenager, for my own family as well. And I think there's a big drive in that community, a lot of hustle and bustle. And a lot of people... My people that had all, my peers that had lived there previously, people like Damon Albarn as well. Yeah. I mean, they lived on Fairlock Road around the corner. They, they went on to do great things, and I, I, I wanted to, to have a piece of that too. I come from a similar part of London. I come from Kingsbury, and you know, the sort of people who lived in Kingsbury, similarly, that they, they developed talents to get out and move on. You know, Courtney Pine, the jazz saxophonist, lived around the corner from me. George Michael grew up just around the corner from me. Stuart Pearce, yeah. Mike Gatting, England fo- and cr- cricket, football and cricket captains, respectively. Uh, you know, Ron, uh, Charlie Watts, the, 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 the now, unfortunately, late drummer from the Rolling Stones. Uh, these not particularly fashionable parts of London that a lot of the chattering classes, the bien pensant, won't be seen dead in. They do create incredible people, don't they? They're right. kind of social mobility factories, and, and maybe you're a product of that. So... You were flogging micro scooters and you were making more money than all your teachers combined, probably, by the age of 15, 16. It's no wonder they wanted to see the back of you. What happened next? So, um, left school at 16, did my GCSEs, despite not being there much, and thought I could do anything and everything, to be honest. Um, so, between the age of, I'd say, 16 and 25, I'd set publishing companies up. Um, I was publishing national magazines in the UK. I was actually the UK's youngest publisher of national magazines. I was buying and selling uh, businesses, investing in uh, quite heavily into property, cosmetics manufacturing. Uh, I also did a stint in Australia um, where I had a, a, a record deal, a record label with a, with, a, with a good friend of mine at the time who was very successful. So I did, a, I travelled the world a lot and I did what I enjoyed. I, I, would, I think it's fair to say I gave up my, you know, the age from about 11 to 16. I was just locked in a bedroom. I wasn't as sociable as you'd want to be. And I got out and saw the world and started investing, some very successfully, some very badly. But that's the nature of the Always game. make new mistakes, right? That's a real motto of proper entrepreneurs. Well, correct. And, and that, um, but then I got, came back to the UK, I think, when I was about 27, or sh- should I say stayed in one place for more than three months. And I wanted to do something really big, something really meaningful. I wanted to grow a multinational. I wanted to employ a lot of people, create work, create jobs, create industry... 
um, and also, you know, elevate my, my skills. Instead of going from one small business to the next, million dollar here deal, million dollar there, how do I, how do I really push myself? And I guess went on sabbatical, so to speak, and paid for it for, or through business, but decided to stop and think about something big. Um, so about, I'm going to say, eight years ago, I, I, with some others, invested in a business in the UK, which uh, unfortunately failed, but it had an asset in Sri Lanka, which was manufacturing uh, garments for companies like Tesco's, Marks right. and Spencer's. Very small company, about 3,000 employees, about $20 million in revenue. And I thought to myself, well, I need to do something because otherwise the investment's lost and there's a very interesting asset. So I moved out to Sri Lanka. And, uh, this is in your early 30s. You're in your mid-30s now, right? I think I was about 29. You're 29. You moved to Sri Lanka. Moved to Sri Lanka. And from Leytonstone. From Leytonstone. <laughs> Well, actually, it's a bit I think, beyond the central line. <laughs> I think I was in the West End by then, in central London, and got on a plane to Sri Lanka and, and thought, right, there's something to... That business was also losing money. I thought there's something to be done here. Um, good customer base, uh, good relationships with the banks, good assets. How do I turn this into something? So several years on, that company now does $200 million in revenue. It's got 20,000 staff, 15 factories, Kenya, Ethiopia, Sri Lanka... We had operations... And you still own a chunk of that? Still own a chunk, a, a, a still shareholder. Um, stepped down as uh, chairman a couple of years back and stepped off the board about a year ago. Fantastic management team and, and group of shareholders. That company, operations in Mexico, offices in New York, Hong Kong. So, I, I mean, I'm speeding ahead, but within seven years, I took that business to a $200 million-plus organisation with 20,000 staff. Just in the few minutes we've got left, Dominic, I could talk to you forever, as so often happens with my Money Talks guests. It's a long slot, but it's always too short. I want to ask you about your philanthropic work, and I want to ask you also briefly for your advice to people watching who think they might want to run, run a business. So briefly, you're focused now on philanthropy, right? Yes, I, I'm very much focused on what I call trade for development. I've worked in some very poor countries, and I've seen how businesses investing, generating jobs, is able to change those economies, um, br uh, bring prosperity to communities, but also it's a benefit for Britain. It's a benefit for British businesses to succeed overseas. It's a benefit for us to trade. So I now very much uh, support organiser. I'm the chairman of Computer Aid International. We've helped 14 million people in the UK as, as well as across the world get access to computers and digital skills. I'm a non-executive director with the ODI, the Overseas, uh, Overseas Development Institute. Overseas Indeed. Development Institute exactly. Very august body. Um, so we, we really do a lot of policy and thinking and help governments change for good and help develop governments, help developing countries change for good. You clearly have a, a lot of inner confidence, if I may say so. It doesn't come across to me as arrogance, not at all. Um, I'm not somebody who necessarily thinks arrogance is a, ba is a bad thing, but I, I don't get that vibe from you at all. You're confident about what you've done. You're clearly proud of what you've done. There's some kind of inner strength that comes from somewhere. So what would you say in a nutshell, Dominic McVeigh, to people watching who think, I might want to run a business? Presumably you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't uh, advise them to bunk off school. <laughs> <laughs> Education comes first. <laughs> he says. <laughs> but what is... There's various forms of education. Look, I, I think I, I asked a lot of questions, and I continue to do so. Uh, I challenged people a lot. I try and re get as much sources of information as possible. And I look for opportunities. And any young entrepreneurs watching this, remember time is on your side. I always say Colonel Sanders didn't sell KFC until he was 65. Right? But also, there's a good chance we can all live to 100. So if you're getting started in your later years, there's a lot of time to get going still today. Ask the questions, challenge, look for the opportunities. Don't jump on the bandwagon. Uh, that's, you know, don't, ju don't just quit the job because you think something is coming up. You've got to make sure, do your research, and be passionate about it, because then it's not about the money, it's about the business. And eventually the money will come.